This morning we are in John chapter 5. Um, we're going to finish the, uh, the chapter, Lord willing, uh, verses 31 through 47. But I just want to remind you that this whole chapter is really dealing with just one event. And so all of these things are tied together. If I make reference to the earlier part of the chapter, it's only just to get the context of what's going on here. But let me just read for you uh, verses 31 through 47 as we begin. This is what um, John writes by the inspiration of the Spirit, remembering that these are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, if I alone testify about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who testifies of me, and I know that the testimony which he gives about me is true. You have sent to John, and he has testified to the truth. But the testimony which I receive is not from man. But I say these things so that you may be saved. He was a lamp that was burning and was shining, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. But the testimony which I have is greater than the testimony of John for the works which the Father has given me to accomplish. The very works that I do testify about me that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me, he has testified of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. You do not have his word abiding in you. For you do not believe him whom he sent. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me. And you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. I do not receive glory from men, but I know you, that you do not have the love of God in yourselves. I have come in my Father's name and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God? Do not think that I will accuse you before the Father. The one who accuses you is Moses, in whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? May the Lord bless his word to our hearing uh, this morning. Now remember, John started this chapter with the healing of the man at Bethesda. And we saw that Jesus did this on the Sabbath. And he had the man carry his pallet on the Sabbath in order to draw the attention of the Jews. Once he had it, we saw that he made several astonishing claims, at least these would be astonishing claims, if he was anything other than what he actually was or is, and that is equal with God. He said that God was his father, and as Jew, the Jews understood what he meant by that. If God is his father, then he must be equal with him. He said that he was doing what he saw his father doing, which doesn't mean that the father would do it and then he would do it, but rather the father was revealing his plan to his son, and his son was continually carrying that out as a dutiful son. He claimed to have the authority to give spiritual life to those who were spiritually dead, to be the one who would one day empty the tombs of all the dead, the righteous and the wicked at one time, and gather all of those who were yet alive together for the final judgment, and that he would be the one who would judge all men on that day. Now, as I've said, these were remarkable claims, astonishing claims, especially to the ears of the Jew. And how could the Jews possibly know that what Jesus was saying was true? Well, this morning Jesus tells them why it is they should believe him. First, and oddly enough, we, we would say oddly, but we'll understand why Jesus said this, that they shouldn't merely take his word for it, but secondly, that they should listen to his Father. So let's look at these two things this morning, see what it is that Jesus is actually saying. First of all, Jesus tells them that they shouldn't just take his word for it. He says in verse 31, If I alone testify about myself, my testimony is not true. 
Now that could be kind of startling on the surface, but we do need to understand what he's not saying here. He's not saying that what he said about himself isn't true or that they couldn't trust him because Jesus is the truth. Remember he says to Thomas in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Everything that Jesus says, everything he ever said is absolutely true. It cannot fail to be true, and it will stand forever. He is, after all, the Word of God. What he meant by this was that they were not bound necessarily to believe that what he had told them was true unless there was more than one witness who said it. Remember what Moses writes in Deuteronomy um, 19, verse 15. A single witness shall not rise up against a man on account of any iniquity or any sin which he has committed. On the evidence of two or three witnesses, a matter shall be confirmed. Now this principle not only has to do with evidence that is presented in a criminal trial, it has to do with establishing the truth of any testimony. If only one person says something, it might be true, but it doesn't necessarily prove anything. Now, Jesus' point is simply this, that he isn't the only one who is making this claim, the claims that he's making. He says in verse 32, there is another who testifies of me, and I know the testimony which he gives about me is true. Now, who is it that Jesus is referring to? He seems to assume that what they would understand by that is that he was talking about John the Baptist, which is why he goes on to say in verse 33, you have sent to John, and he has testified to the truth. Now again, within the context of the book, what he's saying is he's referring back to that earlier time when the scribes and Pharisees sent messengers to find out if John the Baptist was in fact the Christ, which he wasn't. But they did find out why he was sent, and that was to prepare his way. In chapter 1 of John's Gospel, in verses 19 through 23, this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent to him priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? And he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. They asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. Then they said to him, who are you? So that we may give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as Isaiah the prophet said. Now he is not the Christ, but he testified of the Christ. That Jesus was coming after him. And he even identified him at his baptism, as we know. Now, some of the Jews, Jesus said, even believed him for a while. Look at verse 35. He was the lamp that was burning and was shining, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. In other words, they listened to what he had to say as he was uh, broadcasting the word of God, as he was preaching the, well, the, uh, the uh, teaching of repentance to get them ready. But apparently, they stopped believing because they needed more. Well, Jesus tells them that he has more, something more than a human witness. Verse 34, but the testimony which I receive is not from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. Well, what is the testimony that Jesus is referring to here? It's that of his father. They shouldn't just take his word for it. They shouldn't just take John the Baptist's word for it. They should believe that he is who he said he was based on the evidence the Father has given, based on his testimony. Well, what is that testimony? Jesus says it consists of two things, the works that he gave Jesus to do and his words. First of all, his works, verse 36. But the testimony which I have is greater than the testimony of John for the works which the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I do testify about me that the Father has sent me. What are the works that he was referring to? Well, the works that Jesus was speaking about, even in the context of the 
Gospel of John, but even in chapter 5. Remember, he said, not only the things the Father has shown him up to this point, but even the greater things the Father was going to show him that he might do them, that they might marvel. He was referring to the things that had already happened in his ministry, the turning of the water into wine at Cana of Galilee, the healing of the royal official's son who was in Capernaum while Jesus was in, still in Cana of Galilee, the healing of the sick man at the pool of Bethesda, which we've seen is the immediate context of this passage, the miracle that ended in his carrying the pallet on the Sabbath day. You know, it's interesting, isn't it? The very thing that they were actually accusing Jesus of, breaking the Sabbath by healing a man on the Sabbath, was the very thing that Jesus was pointing to, to prove that what he was saying was actually true. It was the Father's witness that Jesus is his Son. Remember, miracles are what the Lord uses to vindicate his messengers, which is why John records the miracles, the signs that he does in this book so that we might know who Jesus is. He writes near the end of his gospel in chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. This is the Father's witness to his Son, that he is who he claimed to be, that he is, in fact, the Son of the Father, that he is, in fact, equal with God, and that he is the Messiah, the only one who can actually save them, the only one who can actually save us. But the Father testified not just through his works, but also through his word. Jesus goes on to say in verse 37, And the Father who sent me, he has testified of me in a way other than through these works. Now here's kind of a difficult passage to understand here, uh, what Jesus means. We might be tempted to think that what he's referring to here is the Father's testimony at the baptism of our Lord Jesus Christ. After all, he did speak from heaven. Uh, Matthew 3, verses 16 through 17. After being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened. And he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting on him. And behold, a voice out of the heavens said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now certainly the father did testify of his son. On that occasion, the people who heard it marveled at this voice. What could it mean? This by itself would have been a very compelling argument that Jesus was his son. But then Jesus goes on to say in verse 37, You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. Now what does Jesus mean by that? that these Jews weren't necessarily at the baptism. The Father did speak, but they didn't happen to be there. Was Jesus simply referring to all those times in the Old Testament when God appeared, that it really wasn't the Father, it was really Him? Uh, some people might take it that way. But you need to remember that He's speaking to these Jews who were present. He says, you have not heard His voice. You have not seen His form. What is Jesus referring to here? I think it's more likely that he's referring to the scriptures because in the scriptures God speaks in the scripture God reveals himself the father reveals himself he reveals of course his son but even though God speaks and even though God reveals himself in scripture there were many who don't hear there are many who don't see and the reason why they don't is because they don't have faith because God hasn't given them eyes to see he hasn't given them ears to hear and that makes sense out of what Jesus says next in verse 38. You do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe him whom he sent. Jesus is saying to them, you possess God's word. You have many copies of it. Not every individual Jew had a copy, but they possessed them in the synagogues. They heard them read continually. But the word doesn't possess you. It doesn't abide in you. It may be in your mind, you may have heard it read, you may have memorized portions of it, and certainly if you had to depend just on hearing the Word of God in a synagogue once a week, 
you would try to memorize what you were hearing because you wouldn't have it in front of you all the time. They memorized lots of it. But it wasn't in their hearts. Their eyes had not been opened to see its beauty. They hadn't yet embraced it. They didn't truly understand it. Because if they had, they would have believed Jesus. If they had, they would have come to Jesus to receive the life that the Father has granted to him to give. Jesus says in verses 39 and 40, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify of me, about me, and you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. The fact that Jesus is the Messiah, the fact that he is the Son of the Father, that he is equal with God, that he has eternal life in himself and the ability to give it to whomever he wills, is not based merely on the testimony of men. It isn't based merely on his own testimony as the Son of Man, nor on that of John the Baptist, but it's based on God's testimony through his works and through God's own word. And yet in spite of that, they still would not believe. Jesus says in verses 41 through 44, I do not receive glory from men, but I know you, that you do not have the love of God in yourselves. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another, and you do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God? Now, this is the portion we're going to look at this evening, because this is a parenthetical you know, reference Jesus is making. It doesn't follow along the same lines, but let me just say this about it because we don't want to entirely pass over it. Jesus says to them, you would be willing to believe others when they come in their own name if in their coming they would advance your worldly pursuits. But you won't accept or receive the one who clearly will not do that, who will not give you worldly honor. They won't receive Jesus, even though there is one far greater testifying of him who is the Father. Now, we're going to look at that point a little bit more carefully this evening. So Jesus says you're willing to receive other people if they all advance your worldly pursuits, but you're not willing to receive the one the Father has sent. You're not willing to receive his testimony. I'm not just telling you I'm the Messiah, Jesus is saying. My Father is showing you through the works, through his words, but yet you will not receive me. So what does Jesus say is going to happen to them? Well, the same thing is going to happen to everyone who does not receive him, who does not listen to the Father, who does not receive this testimony. They will be condemned. And interestingly, Jesus says, I'm not the one who's going to condemn you. You're going to be condemned by the one that you are trusting the most. You're going to be condemned by Moses. Jesus says in verse 45, do not think that I will accuse you before the Father. The one who accuses you is Moses, in whom you have set your hope. Jesus, we are told, did not come into the world in order to accuse the world. He didn't come into the world to condemn the world. He came into the world that the world might be saved. We haven't gotten to this point in John yet, but we read in John chapter 12, verses 46 through 50. I have come as light into the world, so that everyone who believes in me will not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my sayings and does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my sayings has one who judges him. The word I spoke is what will judge him at the last day. For I did not speak on my own initiative, but the Father who himself who sent me has given me a commandment as to what to say and what to speak. I know that his commandment is eternal life. Therefore, the things I speak, I speak just as the Father has told me. Jesus said, I didn't come to accuse you. I didn't come to condemn you. But what I've said to you will condemn you on that last day. And not only he says what I've said to you, but Moses is also going to condemn you. Moses, in whom you have put your trust. You think Moses is going to get you into heaven. 
But Moses is actually going to condemn you. Why? Because what Moses said is also a part of the Father's testimony regarding Jesus. He says in verse 46, For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. Well, what did Moses write? Well, you know, Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch. There's a lot in there. But here's a few things. Jesus, he wrote that Jesus is the seed of the woman who is going to crush the head of the serpent. That he is the son of Shem, through whom Japheth would be saved. Basically, he was going to enlarge the tent of Shem, and Japheth one day was going to come in. I was talking about Gentile salvation. He is the lamb that the father was going to provide as a sacrifice in place of his son Isaac. He is the son of Abraham, the seed of Abraham, through whom all the nations would be blessed. He is the fulfillment of the priesthood, the prophet like Moses, the one who fulfills the law of God, uh, the one whose sacrifice, which alone, of course, can atone for sin, was pictured by all those animal sacrifices. Now, if they had really, by the Spirit of God, understood what Moses was really pointing to, what the Father was really saying about His Son in Moses' writings, they would have believed what Jesus was saying. But He says in verse 47, if you do not believe His writings, how will you believe My words? If you're not willing to listen to the testimony that God gives regarding His Son through Moses, He says, there is no hope. Even what Moses says is enough, enough of a testimony of the Father to prove that Jesus is who he said he was. Remember what uh, Abraham said to the rich man after, you know, in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, after he begged Abraham to send Lazarus to his brothers. He says in Luke 16, verses 29 through 31, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. But he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to them, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. Is that true? Absolutely. Because Jesus rose from the dead and the Jews still didn't believe. Because they didn't believe what Moses wrote. They didn't believe their own scriptures. If they had, they would have believed Jesus because Jesus is actually the one who wrote it. And it was written about him. But it's the Father's witness. They did not receive the Father's witness regarding the Son. Therefore, they will not receive the Son. Now, to those of you here this morning who haven't received Jesus, you do need to understand that the Lord has given you more evidence than just the words of those around you who say they believe these things. You know, Jesus came and he said, if... I'm the only one talking about these things, then what I'm saying isn't true. And we understand that it was true, but they don't necessarily have to receive it. And maybe we think, uh, well, someone's come to me and I see a bunch of people around me who say they believe that Jesus is the Son of God, but does that really prove anything? I mean, there's a lot of people in the world that believe a lot of different things. Moonies believe that what Reverend Moon was teaching is true. Mormons believe Joseph Smith. Muslims believe Muhammad. Atheists believe, well, they believe in evolution. Uh, just because they believe in something, even if they're sincere, doesn't make that thing true. So what's the difference between what they believe and what the Christian believes? Well, the difference is that God has testified about what it is that Christians believe. God has testified about his son in his word, in the Bible. I mean, here you have an eyewitness record of the things that the Father gave Jesus to do to prove that he was his son. Here you have the testimony of the Father, not only recorded his voice from heaven on three different occasions, but you also have, through the apostles and prophets, the entire word of God, what it is the Father intended, why he sent his son into the world, and how it is you can be saved. And that testimony of the Father is the only testimony that the Holy Spirit is going to bear witness to because the Bible alone is God's Word. 
If all you had was somebody else's word for it, that would not be enough, but you have more. You have God's word. And I would urge you to believe this word because if you don't believe the Father's testimony, then you will be condemned. The Father has given you his Son so that you might escape condemnation. Again, remember what Jesus says in John 5, verse 34. But the testimony which I receive is not from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn the world. He came to save the world. Why was he telling them about the Father's testimony? The purpose behind it was their salvation. He wanted them to be saved. So listen to what the Father says about his Son. Believe that testimony. Believe the works. Believe the eyewitness testimony. Believe, most of all, of course, the testimony of the Holy Spirit who confirms that these words are true. This is not the word of man. This is the word of God. And receive what he says. Turn from your sins and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Now let me just say to the rest of you who have received the Father's testimony that you need to share this with others. You need to share what God has said regarding his son. It's not just your word against the Muslim, your word against the Mormon, your word against the Mooney, your word against the Jehovah's Witness. It's, it's not a matter of who can maybe you know, share their experiences, who has the greater experiences and so forth, these religious experiences, because a lot of people base their religions on religious experience. We have far more than that. We have more than a transformation of life. We have more than an opinion. We do have the testimony that God has borne regarding His Son, and we know it's true, and we also know the Spirit of God is going to bear witness to this testimony. He's going to make it powerful to save it doesn't depend just on you and, and on me and as far as how much you know, intensity we can come up with, how convinced we are, although God will use those things, it ultimately depends on the Spirit of God taking the Word of God and making it alive in their hearts and their minds. But you see, this is the only thing he's going to do that with. G uh, Paul says in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. The reason why the gospel alone is the power of God's salvation is because it is the gospel alone the Spirit of God will empower and use to convert, to awaken to danger, and to use to open the eyes of the blind and change the hearts of those who have stony hearts. So let me just say again, that which the Father used in your life to change your life to open your eyes, to change your hearts, the testimony that he has borne about his son is the same thing you need to share with others if you are to see them also converted and come to Christ. So again, it's not just our word against the word of every other religion. It is God's word against their word. And God will make his testimony and his word powerful when and where he wills. So don't be afraid to share it with others because that is how God saves. Well, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to help us to receive what he has told us this morning and to be able to use it.